Hello and welcome to another session of a um, short recorded English classes. Okay, uh, this is session number two and today we're going to be talking about art, but um, a slightly different take than um, last session. This time we're going to be talking about uh, European art and um, we're going to have a slightly uh, similar setup. Um, I have a short uh, video that we'll have a quick look at where a actually in a, a, a UK professor um, is going to talk about some different works of art um, and how they relate to the seasons. So we don't have time to look at all four seasons, but we're going to start with uh, summer and then see if we get time to go on to another one. Um, so we'll watch what she says to have, uh, what she has to say about them first, and then we'll go through um, the transcript of uh, what she says, and we'll go through some of the, uh, the terms and have a talk about those, okay? Hopefully you'll find this interesting. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen now, and then we'll get underway. Okay, hopefully everyone will be able to see the screen coming up in just a sec. Right, now I have a document here. Okay, great. Oh, we're starting with uh, autumn is the second one, but we're going to start with summer. Okay, now this comes from, um, and I'll put the web link up here again from the Open um, University, uh, which I've fallen in love with recently for all kinds of interesting information that we can find up there. Um, so this is more of a, um, the topic is more about the history of art and art and the seasons, which I just thought was so interesting. So the first film um, is going to be looking at how artists evoke or um, kind of bring to mind a, the kind of the feeling or the picture um, or the memory of the heat of summer. and. Uh, Emma Barker, who is the lecturer in art history, she is going to talk uh, um, painters such as Bruegel, Monet, and Surat. Okay, so it's really interesting. Let's have a look. We'll go to the YouTube um, um, thing now where it's going to go for about three minutes, then we'll come back and have a discussion. Okay. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire, Let's go Before the modern era, people's sense of the different times of year was really shaped by the cycle of nature, so that for them, summer meant the fruits and flowers that the earth produces at this season, as you can see from this bizarre figure personifying summer by the 16th century Italian artist Giovanni Archimboldo. The main occupation that people associated with summer was not going on holiday, as now, but rather working in the fields to bring in the harvest. As you can see from the 16th century Netherlandish artist Peter Bruegel's painting of harvesters, painted as part of a series of pictures depicting the seasons. In fact, however, most of the figures are not actually working, but are rather resting, having their lunch. The rich man for whom the picture was painted would not have wanted to look at a painting depicting the harsh reality of back-breaking labour in the heat of the summer sun. In modern times, however, from around 1800, you get the emergence of the modern summer holiday as people started going to the seaside for their annual break. One of the beach resorts favoured by the Victorian middle classes was Ramsgate, the subject of a painting by the artist William Powell Frith. It's a large and complex picture with many figures, which would have taken months to paint. Very different is this little painting by the late 19th century French artist Claude Monet of his wife and a friend on the beach at the fashionable resort of Trouville. It was painted very rapidly on the spot. There are even grains of sand embedded in the paint surface, blown onto the canvas by the wind that you can see in the scudding clouds painted by Monet in the sky. What seems strange by modern standards is that both pictures show people sitting on the beach fully dressed. Even when they did go in the water, the middle classes of this period wore voluminous bathing costumes. By contrast, another French artist, Georges Seurat, painted working class youths taking a dip in the River Seine, 
with the factories of Paris blowing smoke in the background. They may be too poor to go away on a summer holiday, but they certainly look a lot more relaxed than the rich people in their stiff clothes. So I think really what all of these paintings taken together show is the way that our understanding of summer, even our experience of it, has varied over the centuries depending on culture, class, and other factors. Okay, so <clears throat> let us come back. Okay, so yes, that was very interesting. She's quite quick though, so we might just have a look at the transcript now um, in a little bit more detail. Okay, so um, now, okay, she, so we're talking about um, depictions of someone. When we're talking about de depicting, we're really just talking about describing something, drawing a picture of. Um, so we're talking about how people have, or how different artists have described or drawn pictures about summer over the centuries. Okay, so um, she started off with the um, bizarre figure personifying summer by uh, the Italian artist Giovanni Arcimboldo. I'm not sure about my pronunciation there. Okay, so as we can see in the picture, uh, the figure was made up from um, various fruits and vegetables. So we can say that that person or that figure was really taking on um, or being a, um, a concrete symbol of, of, of summer or being like um, the, the, a person who represented um, summer. Okay, she then moved on to the Netherlandish artist um, so obviously someone from the Netherlands we can um, describe as Netherlandish um, Peter Bruegel's painting and his painting was of harvesters so harvesters would be the person the people that would work to bring in the harvest the harvest could be corn could be wheat um, no matter the crop we talk about harvest harvesting so the harvesters or the um, people who worked to bring in the harvest okay now moving along um, she then moves on to people going to the seaside people going to the beach in summer okay and the first uh, painting that she showed there was the one by um, William Powell Frith um, and that was the Victorian middle classes going to Ramsgate the popular bathing resort um, so when we talk about the Victorian middle classes, we are obviously referring to uh, the historical period where Queen Victoria was um, the ruler of the, um, of the United Kingdom, um, and that period of time was named after her, hence Victorian. Um, and you could also see the Victorian style of dress, um, so the big, uh, the big skirts um, and the bonnets and, um, as she said, very uh, voluminous um, clothing and voluminous bathing costumes. So when we talk about something being voluminous, voluminous, the word comes from a volume, as in volume being a measure of size, right? So um, if we talk about something has a big volume, it means that it can fit lots in inside it right so um, it's of a large size and so that brings to mind or evokes um, this idea that when we refer to something as being voluminous we're referring to something that's very large in size or extent okay and so a voluminous bathing costume means something that is um, it's going to have a lot of material it's going to have a lot of um, it doesn't mean that it's too big for you it just means that it is um, has a lot of fabric and is very uh, kind of a complex uh, piece of clothing okay with lots of extra um, maybe ruffles and pleats and um, a big skirt it might be a tall hat things like this would all help to make pieces of clothing voluminous, okay? 
So when you're talking about a uh, another way of, of using volume is like, for example, if you're talking about a book, you might say, uh, you might call it a volume, okay? So if we do this because we're talking about, um, it helps to evoke a sense that a book can be part of something larger, right? So, um, for example, if you have a series of books, you might have volume one, volume two, volume three, okay? so. Those books in total, um, a number of volumes comprise um, the, t the total of a, a series of books. Okay, so it's kind of making me think about um, volume as in um, size or extent. Here it's talking more about extent because it is not just one standalone book, there are many volumes in the series. All right, so now um, to go back um, to the previous paragraph where um, she was talking about the tiny painting by uh, Monet. And the painting was of his wife and a friend on the beach at the fashionable resort of Trouville. Okay, and she says this instead was very rapidly painted on the spot. So on the spot means um, he just painted it uh, very quickly at that point in time. Um, and he painted it on the beach. So his wife and friend were sitting there on the beach. He decided at that moment and at that place to do a quick painting of them. So that's why there are grains of sand embedded or stuck onto the paint surface, blown onto the canvas by the wind, evident in the picture itself in the scudding clouds in the sky. So what this means is that we, how do we know that it's windy? Because we can see that the, uh, in the picture, we can see the clouds um, going quickly um, across the sky. So that um, scudding means to uh, move along quickly. Okay, so that is the evidence the clouds are the evidence that it is a windy day. Okay, so when we talk about scudding, um, there are a few different ways in which we can um, we can talk we can use the word scudding um, or to scud, uh, being the verb. Okay, generally we use it um, in terms of um, weather weather related things. So, for example, um, we might say something like. <laughs> The moon was bright, but clouds scudding across it kept throwing them into darkness. Uh, that's actually a sentence from um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Okay, so the, what this means is the clouds were moving quickly along, um, for example, being blown by a wind. Okay, and then here, the second example we have is as the scudding day passed overhead, the dingy windows glowed and faded. Okay, so the day um, is scudding means that obviously it's a windy day and um, the this the clouds are scudding through the sky. Okay, and then um, you can also use it in terms of um, water as well, right? So the third example we have here is um, talking about um, a crew of people who are um, rowing in a boat, okay? We know they're rowing because they're talking about the smooth oar blades which sent the white foam scudding by, okay? So because the rowers are in the boat, they're pulling the oars. As they pull the oars, the oars move quickly through the water and the, um, the water uh, foams up, becomes white and scuds by because the oar is moving quite quickly. And then finally, um, our final example is um, talking about scudding sunlight. Okay, so um, this is quite a poetic um, way of describing sunlight. So if the sunlight is moving quickly along, um, that's a way, I suppose, of describing um, maybe it's a, um, 
a windy day and um, the the author has the impression that the sunlight is kind of um, is moving along quickly. Okay. Now, scudding is not a word that you hear very often, particularly often, um, but quite often um, in this context of clouds, clouds moving quickly through the sky. Okay. All right. So now to go back down to voluminous, she did mention that um, the people on the beach were um, in the first two uh, pictures in, um, that she talked about where people are on the beach, uh, is that they're wearing a lot of clothes. So they're wearing voluminous clothing or bathing costumes. Okay, so bathing costumes is an interesting term because um, when we go to the beach, obviously we wear, um, we wear bathing costumes, but we think of that these days is in, um, we have different ways to say it. Okay, we can say um, a swimming costume, we can say a swimming suit, a swimsuit, we can say bathers, uh, we can say um, in Australia, we say uh, cosy, and um, that's where cosy comes from is um, a costume, a bathing costume. Okay, so we have shortened that, abbreviated it to cosy. Okay, um, but when we first started to refer to uh, what we wear to the beach was in Victorian times when people started um, designing special costumes um, to wear whilst swimming. So this is quite an old term that we have updated to our um, modern terminology. I mean, these days I would mainly say um, we would refer to specific kinds of bathing costumes. For example, um, for women would be um, a one piece, um, which just means a bathing costume that is um, all in one piece. Whereas a bikini uh, is a two piece. You have a, um, a, a top and a bottom. Uh, whereas for men, generally they would wear um, um, swimming shorts, we might say, or uh, boxer shorts. Uh, or um, sometimes we even refer to bathing costumes by brand. Uh, for example, uh, Speedos. If you say Speedos, people know that you're referring to a kind of swimming suit. Okay, and then uh, when we talk about uh, going for a swim, the lady in the, um, in the video talks about working class youths taking a dip in the River Seine with the factories of Paris blowing smoke in the distance. Okay, so taking a dip is a phrase that we use when we talk about um, having a swim. Now, why do we say dip instead of swim? Well, we might, um, when we talk about having a quick swim or a short swim, that's when we say dip because when we dip, we talk about plunging into something quickly um, and it might not necessarily be a swim but it might be um, plunging into any liquid or soft substance. So for example, we can say to dip your toe into the swimming pool but you can also dip your finger into uh, some paint, okay? You can dip a, a biscuit into your tea uh, you can dip a, um, a chip into um, some salsa, okay? So it just means to plunge something or put something quickly into a liquid or something soft, okay? Now also when you talk about um, um, dipping into something, as I, as I mentioned, you can um, dip your toe into something. Now, this can literally be taken to mean um, you put your toe quickly into the water, but we also use it these days to talk about um, to try something out. So, for example, um, I might say, um, 
tomorrow I'm going to my first um, dancing class. I've never taken a dancing class before, but I'm going to dip my toe into the waters and have a try. Okay, so when we talk about dip your toe into the water, we can just be talking about trying something for the first time, having a go at something, okay, that you've never done before, okay. Um, um, another example might be um, after COVID, um, then for people that haven't traveled for a long time um, and maybe you're feeling a little bit unsure about getting back into travel so I might say well for me um, usually I do independent travel but uh, I'm a bit worried about travel after after COVID ends so I'm going to um, dip my toe into the water and try uh, a tour group uh, because I feel this may be a, a safer way to travel okay I haven't toured with a tour group before but I'm going to dip my toe in the water and try to travel with a tour group as, as a different way of doing things okay all right so that is talking about um, dipping um, yeah, so dip can be a quick swim as well as a delicious sauce. So when we talk about um, dipping a chip, we can dip a chip into a dip. Dip meaning the sauce, okay? So um, that is, there are a lot of different ways to use it, a dip. Okay, now let's have a quick look. We have 10 minutes left, so we're going to have a very quick look at um, autumn. So here's a, a quick video. We'll just watch a little bit of it. Um, talking about autumn and the different ways in which artists have looked at autumn. So let's quickly move to this. Grammarly does more than catch errors. With Grammarly, you can find really good Hello, I'm Emma Barker, Senior Lecturer in Art History at The Open University. Now that autumn's here, I've been thinking about the way that this season has been represented in art over the centuries. In European art, autumn is traditionally represented as the season of the grape harvest, as you can see from this image of the month of September from a richly decorated book of hours, that is, a prayer book, which was created in the 15th century for a French prince, the Duke of Berry. Several artists worked on the manuscript, which took decades to complete. The image of September shows peasants working in the fields below the lofty towers of the royal chateau of Saumur, making clear the gulf between the great and the humble during this period. In the Renaissance, with the revival of interest in antiquity, autumn was increasingly personified in the figure of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, feasting and fertility, whom you see here, in a late 16th century painting by the Italian artist Caravaggio. The god appears here as a dreamy looking youth with grapes and vine leaves in his hair, fingering the sash of his robe. The table on front of him holds a carac of wine and a bowl of fruit, and he holds out a glass as if inviting us to join him. The viewer is encouraged to share in nature's bounty and indulge in sensual pleasure. Increasingly, European artists Okay, so <clears throat> we won't have time to watch more of that at the moment, but I will um, leave a, a link uh, there for you to finish watching that um, after the class is finished. Uh, just a couple of things to highlight in the remaining time. Uh, and I encourage you to go through and read the uh, transcript um, again. Um, after I've been through it, just so you can really um, appreciate uh, all of the, the points that she's making, because it's very interesting, but she gives a lot of very dense information. Okay, so now just to highlight a couple of things that she's talking about, um, she's talking about how in European art, 
autumn is traditionally represented as the season of the great harvest. Okay, so again, we have this word harvest and the people in the picture um, who are the harvesters working to, um, to bring in the, the grapes. Okay, so she um, gives you this image of, which comes from the richly decorated book of hours, which is a volume of prayers created for a French prince, the Duc de Berry in the 15th century. Okay, so remember when we talked in the previous, uh, on the previous page about volume, so volume being, um, yeah, a, a way to describe books that have more than one, um, um, more than one in a series. Okay, so why does she talk about as being um, richly decorated? Well, let's have a look. When we talk about something being richly decorated, it means that something is, um, it has a high level of decoration. Um, and that might be in terms of the materials that they've used, like the paint um, has um, very beautiful colors. There is a lot of decoration on the page as well. So that image was very, um, very full, real, very um, kind of uh, richly detailed and um, lots of colors, that kind of thing. So it was really, there was a lot to look at. So that's why we say richly decorated um, as kind of an abundance of decoration. Okay, now then she also talks about this being um, the image being a manuscript. Okay, so a manuscript, um, when we're talking about in these times in the 15th century, a manuscript would be a, uh, a handwritten um, document that would be done um, usually uh, made from um, lamb or sheep skin, um, sometimes um, the uh, skin of um, cows as well, and um, written, um, usually produced in uh, monasteries where monks would um, be the ones who would use um, different inks to create these documents. Okay. Now, further on, um, she talks about um, the figure of Bacchus, and Bacchus is this, if you're doing any amount of reading um, in, in English, you quite often find references to Bacchus and the adjective, which is Bacchanalian. And because Bacchus was the Roman god of wine, if we see the adjective Bacchanalian, that means um, when we're referring to either people drinking a lot of wine, or maybe a party where a lot of wine was served. Um, and it means when people are um, enjoying themselves with wine and feasting. Okay, so um, this, the painting that she's talking about uh, was done in the late 16th century by the Italian painter Caravaggio. So um, she, he did this painting of the god Bacchus as a dreamy looking youth, okay? And um, he is kind of inviting us to join him as he drinks a glass of wine, has um, some, um, some fruit, and he holds out his glass as if inviting us to join him. Okay, so this is really a, um, a way of, um, inviting the viewer to enjoy nature's bounty, nature's bounty being the fruits and vegetables and also the wine, okay? Um, now, I will um, provide links to um, this information that I have here. And there are um, another couple of paintings that she goes through, um, which I encourage you to, um, to have a look at. Um, I have highlighted some further um, vocab terms here. And I'd also to encourage you to think about um, maybe um, 
having discussions about like what you like in art, what um, what would your favorite art piece of art be, and how would you describe that to another person? Try and um, think about using some of the words that um, we've heard um, in this session and um, how you could use those in your own um, language and think about um, describing not only what you see on the, on the canvas um, in the painting, but also the significance of that and how you would try to describe that or communicate that to somebody. Okay, so that is um, our 30 minute um, session. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come back to you. Okay, so um, I hope you've enjoyed um, that quick look through uh, a couple of the seasons. Um, and we may have another look at the rest of the seasons um, in the following session. Okay, thank you very much and I will see you soon. Thank you.